Heavenly Father, God, we ask you to be with us and bless us as we break your word. Give us understanding, wisdom, and we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, I was, uh, yesterday I was watching a video on YouTube about uh, a guy following business-wise and so forth, and he brought on, he interviews people sometimes, and he interviewed this skeptic. And uh, this skeptic, he's, uh, he's real big in atheist debates, atheist versus, versus creation debates, and um, you know, it, it was so sad sitting there watching it because they had all these questions that they had trouble answering, and the fact that they couldn't answer and the fact that nobody had given them answers was what led them to become skeptics. And I'm here to tell you that all the answers were in the they're in the Bible. They're all there, and they just they just hadn't studied enough. They hadn't searched out for the truth deep enough. And they were talking about, you know, um, with all the religions in the world, how do we know which one is right? How do we know what, who has the truth and so forth and so on? And, and, and they, you know, they, were, they were looking at all these things. Well, if you study all the religions of the world, you will find out uh, in short order that really the religion of you know, the Bible is really the only religion that believes that we have prophecy and that that prophecy has been fulfilled throughout time over time. And we can pinpoint exactly where we are in history. And we have empirical evidence that we can point to the past and see this prophecy was given and it came to pass. This prophecy was given and it came to pass. And we can see exactly where we are in the historic timeline. And so I would, I would submit to you that the Bible itself with prophecy gives us a reason to believe. Not to mention that Jesus died on the cross and all the evidence we have of a miraculous resurrection and so forth and so on. There's just so much evidence. And so when one gets to study, and you can, in pretty short order, eliminate, if you look at everything objectively, all the religions of the world, you can in pretty short order eliminate all religions except for the religion of the Bible. Well, then they say, well, if, even if that was the case, when you get into the Bible, there's 30-something thousand denominations out there. There's 30-something thousand beliefs out there. You know, who has... The monopoly on truth. Who, who has the truth? Well, first of all, I guess you have to ask the question, what is truth? Who is truth? You know, Jesus, Jesus that we love, he's the truth. He said in John 14 that he is the way, he is the truth, he is the life. So Jesus, we have to have Jesus if we're going to have the truth. We have to have the Word of God. John 17, 17 says that the Word, thy Word, is truth. We have to have the Word of God. The Word of God is truth. We have to have the Holy Spirit. The Bible says in 1 John 5, 6, that the Holy Spirit, the Spirit, is truth. And last but not least, we have to have the law. We have to have the law. Because the Bible says in Psalm 119, verse 142, that the law is truth. They're all eternal. The law, the Holy Spirit, Jesus, the Word. It's all truth. And so you can look at other denominations, other beliefs and so forth, and they don't have the truth in all its forms. They may have some truth. They don't have all truth. And, you know, we're going to look at a little bit of this today. But once you study prophecy and it gives you enough faith to believe in the Bible, which it will if you study enough and, and, and figure out enough, then it kind of goes into, okay, what details do we know? How do we even study the Bible? Well, the Bible tells you how to study itself. Isaiah 28, verse 10 says, For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here little, there little. And so we study these topics, we study these precepts, we study these rules, and it will take you throughout the Scripture. Now you have to know where to go in the Scripture to study these topics, to study these precepts, but once you figure that out, it all comes together and it reads very plainly. It, reads, it becomes very clear what the Bible teaches on any given precept or topic. And so, 
knowing that, you break open the Word of God with prayer. By the way, you need to study the Word of God because not all, you know, prayer is conditional. You don't hear this very often, but it is. The Bible says that, that he that turneth, in Proverbs 28, 9, he that turneth his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer is an abomination. Prayer is conditional. And it's not, now, a sinner's prayer, God will hear any true repentant sinner's prayer. But prayer is con conditional. If we regard iniquity in our heart, God won't hear our prayers. We're told these things in the Bible, and so we need to know these things. That was one of the things that the skeptic had brought up. Is he prayed for someone uh, to make it through a hard, a hard time, and they died. Well, he doesn't know the Scripture. Uh, you know, how, how is God even hearing his prayer? According to the Bible, it's not even going, it's not even being heard. 2 Peter 1 verse 20 says, Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. And so today I want to look at a prophecy that explains who God's people is at the end of time and how we can identify those people and how we can uh, join those people as well as um, how to break down prophecy in the Bible in and of itself. And so, if you would turn with me to the scripture reading, Revelation 12, 17. And if you, uh, if you can't keep up, uh, I apologize because I, I go kind of fast. But Revelation 12, 17, the Bible says there, And the dragon was wroth with the woman, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Okay? It's a mouthful. It's a lot. We're told, let's break this down prophetically, because remember, 2 Peter 1 verse 20, no prophecy of the scriptures of any private interpretation, so the Bible will actually interpret itself. Who or what is the dragon? Well, it just tells you a little bit earlier, a few verses earlier, Revelation 12 verse 9, it tells you that the dragon, that, and the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast into the earth, cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So the dragon, the devil, this, you know, the old serpent, dragon, Satan, he was wroth with the woman. Wroth is just an old English word that means angry. He had wrath toward the woman. Okay. Well, who is this woman? Well, the context says if Satan hates this woman, whoever she is, she's good, right? She, she's on Jesus' side. So we can break it down just from that. But who is the woman? Well, in Bible prophecy, the Bible identifies a church as a woman. The Bible identifies God's people as a woman. The Bible identifies the bride of Christ uh, as the church. The church is the bride of Christ. A bride, of course, is a woman, no matter what we're told today. All right? Now, we know this. We know this from, from several, several things. You know, Jeremiah 6, 2, um, I have likened the daughter of Zion to a comely and delicate woman. And when you're reading Revelation 12, it's, it's describing a comely and delicate woman. The daughter of Zion, I have likened her to a comely and delicate woman. Isaiah 51, 16 talks about, at the end of the verse there, it says, God says unto Zion, thou art my people. Okay? And so God's people in the Bible are described as a comely and delicate woman. And man, Revelation 12 is one of my favorite chapters, I tell you. It's, it's just, it's packed full of information. It shows you where people have, uh, you know, run from the evil men that, that Satan had had, had sent out against person, you know, that were persecuting God's people. And where they fled to, they fled in, into the wilderness and the, the earth swallowed up the flood, this flood of, of evil men, this flood of wicked men, and kind of sets up the, in prophecy of how, you know, the, the people that were being persecuted by the Antichrist power in the Dark Ages, how they came to America and so forth. All of this stuff was told beforehand in the Bible. It's all here. You just have to understand the Bible and how it interprets itself. So Revelation 12, 17, break it down in plain English. The devil was very angry with God's people. The devil was very angry at God's people. Went to make war with them 
and then went to make war with the remnant of her seed. That's what's left over at the end. This is the end of time. And if you know Bible prophecy, this means it has to be after 1798, the year 1798. It has to be after 1844, the year 1844. Sometime after that time, the devil was going to go to war with God's people and it identifies who they are. It says they keep the commandments of God. Okay, you go to, you say, what's, what's the commandments of God? You go to Exodus 20 verse, verses 1 through 17 tells you the commandments. You can go to Deuteronomy 5 verses 6 through 17. It tells you the Ten Commandments of God. And by the way, there are Ten Commandments, not nine. There are Ten Commandments, not eight, as the Antichrist power would teach you. The Antichrist power has changed times and laws. The Bible predicted this in Daniel 7, that, that the Antichrist power would take the Ten Commandment law, they would take the Second Commandment, totally discard it, about bowing down to idols and images, because they want to do that. They would throw it all the way out. They would take the Fourth Commandment, they would shorten it by 90% to remember the Lord's Day. Then they try to confuse people on which day the Lord's Day is, because the rest of the, the commandment's missing. And they, 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 they bump all the rest of the commandments up. The fourth commandment becomes the third, so forth and so on. And the tenth commandment, they divide it into two commandments. So they would have ten commandments again. What a wily devil. You know, I was filming a, a television show one time, and we were in a church. It was a... a I, I, I do uh, handle insurance claims for people when they have, a, have an insurance claim. And this was a, a Pentecostal church out in Texas. And um, they had a huge hell hit their building. We were in there and we were filming. I had a film crew. Had a, my friend of mine had a, uh, the roofer. The roofer, his dad was a pastor. His, his granddad was a pastor. His granddad taught uh, theology at Harvard. And uh, I tell you that to tell you this. We go upstairs and uh, a set of Ten Commandments were on the wall. Not the, the commandments, you understand? A set of Ten Commandments were on the wall. Immediately, I realized the problem. I, tell the, I asked the people with me, I said, Did anybody see a problem with these so-called Ten Commandments here? Nobody had a clue. Nobody had a clue. And I explained to them, Second Commandment is completely missing. The Fourth Commandment will come to the third. I show them the whole thing. They're like, wow. Break out the Bible, show it to them. It's there. I tell you the story. I was in um, Panama City Beach in um, Taco Bell, ordering some good vegan food there. You know, I had to make them, make them make me a special order. They know me, you know. And, um, and so I was there waiting on my food, and a group of uh, young Christians come in. You could tell they were Christians because of the shirts they had on, and, and there's a Christian retreat close to there, and, and it was obvious that they were, they were at, the, you know, at the retreat, and they were coming to get some food. And there were several of them. They were just sitting around talking and so forth. And, um, you know, everybody just kind of standing around. I said, just to break up the, the monotony and, and, and the silence, I said, listen, I said, I got a challenge for you guys, young Christians. Here's a hundred bucks. I pull out a hundred bucks, lay it on the table. If, if between all of you can name the Ten Commandments, here's the catch. You got two minutes to do it, and you can't look it up. But all of you can participate. Guess how many commandments they named? They named nine, actually. And guess which one they forgot to name? The one that starts with the word, word remember. I asked them, I said, you guys see a problem with this? The only commandment you forget is the one that starts with the word remember. We have to know this. The Bible is all about love. The Bible says God is love. 1 John 4, 8 and 16. God is love. If we're going to be like God, we have to be love. We have to be loving. We have to, we have to love Jesus. We have to love each other. That's the greatest two commandments, right? Love God supremely. Love your man, you know, man, fellow man as yourself. Jesus says, John 14, 15 though, if you love me, keep my commandments. And so it all goes together. Please, yes, he's 12, 13. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. This is what the Bible teaches. And so all ten commandments are important. And the Bible says in the fourth commandment that the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. And we would call that today in, in commonly uh, days, commonly known days, as Friday at sunset, 
So Saturday at sunset or sundown, that is the seventh day. But it says back to Revelation 12, 17, that God's people will keep the commandments. This means all ten. Does not mean eight, does not mean nine. It means all ten will keep the commandments of God. And they will have the testimony of Jesus Christ. But we can't just sit back and speculate on what the testimony of Jesus Christ is. Again, we have to let the Bible interpret itself, just like we did with the commandments. The commandments, you want to know what the commandments are? You go to Exodus 20. You go to Deuteronomy 5. You read the Ten Commandments there. The testimony of Jesus, we want to know what that is? The Bible interprets itself. Go to Revelation 19, verse 10. Let's read that verse and hold your finger there. What is the testimony of Jesus Christ? Revelation 19, verse 10. And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. You know, when you're writing out a mathematical equation, if you want to write equals, if you're not writing the word equals, you put is. Testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Now I'm going to show you a parallel verse. Hopefully you can make the connection. I've showed this to people before, and it's like it's just spiritually discerned or something. Some people just can't make the connection. But hold your finger in there, 1910. I want you to go back and forth between these verses and pray for God to help you make this connection. Because what is the spirit of prophecy? Let's, let's have John word in another way. So go to Revelation uh, 22. And we're going to look at verses 8 and 9. Revelation 22, hold your, hold your finger in Revelation 19, 10, and go to Revelation 22, 8, 9. And I'm going to read this. I want you to kind of go back and forth, back and forth, and see if you can make the mental connection, the spiritual connection, if you will. Revelation 22, 8 uh, says, And I, John, saw these things and heard them. And when I heard them and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel, which showed me these things. It's talking about the same kind of thing. Then saith he unto me, See thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant. Sounds like Revelation 19.10, doesn't it? And of thy brethren, the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of these books, worship God. And so you go back to Revelation 19.10, and it says, See thou do it not, I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren, that have the testimony of Jesus, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And so you could say, and I, he said unto me, See thou do it not, and thy fellow servant of their brethren, they have the spirit of prophecy. See, I am thy fellow servant and of their brethren that have the spirit of prophecy. Revelation 22, 9. See thou do it not, and thy fellow servant of their brethren, the prophets. See, the spirit of prophecy and prophets are synonymous. And so God's remnant church, Revelation 12, 17, will not only keep the Ten Commandments, but they will have the gift of prophecy. See, God's not going to let his people at the end of time that has been dumbed down, frankly, by 6,000 years of sin go into this fight unarmed. He's going to give us information. See, go with me, if you will. Let's go to 1 Corinthians. And let's look at verses, uh, chapter 1 and verses 6 and 7. 1 Corinthians. See, the gift of prophecy is the highest gift. You have the gift of prophecy, you're not, gonna, you're not coming behind in any gift. See, 1 Corinthians 1, verses 6 and 7, even as the testimony of Christ, testimony of Jesus, that spirit of prophecy, was confirmed in you so that you come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. See, those of us at the end of time that are waiting for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Adventists that keep the commandments, will have the spirit of prophecy confirmed in them. Will have the gift of prophecy. The Bible says it. And there's so many types and anti-types with Moses and so forth and so on. We won't get into it today, but it's phenomenal. You have to study these things. It's just the most... It's, it's, it, it, literally, it just like makes your bones come alive. You, if you... Get on fire for the Word of God. If you start studying, get into it, dive into it. Uh, it's, it's just absolutely, absolutely amazing. So, I hope you guys are following so far 
If you have if you have the spirit of prophecy, you have the gift of prophecy, I'm telling you, it makes the devil's trickery look like child's play. You know, the Bible is is hard to understand for some people, uh, especially people starting out. And so God has given us a gift to, to just magnify, uh, magnify what's being said and, and, and reiterate what's being said. All the answers are in the scripture. All, everything's in the Bible, and this is this is all we need. And uh, but God gives us gifts, and when God gives us gifts, He gives it to us for a reason, and we need to take advantage of those gifts. Now, when you start talking about prophets in the last days and so forth and so on, oh by the way, this church has a third characteristic that's found in Revelation fourteen twelve because Revelation fourteen six through twelve is the three angels' messages, and God's end time people will give the message that. The, the, the everlasting gospel. They will give that. They will give the message that Babylon has fallen. They will give the message that don't receive the mark of the beast. By the way, this is what the mark of the beast is. Receive the seal of God. Worship God. Oh, by the way, this is what the seal of God is. So you have to, um, you have to study the scripture and you, you have to just dive in. But Revelation 14, 12 says that when it gets to the bottom there, it says, here is the patience of the saints. Here is are they that have the, uh, the faith of Jesus? Here's the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Again, keeping the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. This righteousness by faith. We're not saved by our own works. We are saved by Jesus. We're saved through, through faith. By His grace, through His righteousness. We can take Jesus' righteousness and put it on ourselves if we would just accept Jesus. And so when you start talking about the spirit of prophecy and prophets... You have to go to Matthew 24 and see what Jesus says in the last days. Who here believes we're living in the last days? I mean, I don't, I don't think it could be any more clear. Matthew 24, starting at verse 4, you know, or, you know verse 3, the disciples come to Jesus and says, Tell us the signs you're coming. Tell us what the signs of the end of the world. Tell us what, what's, what these things are going to be like. In verse 4, Jesus answered to them, and the first thing he says is, Take heed that no man deceive you. So at the end of the world, deception is going to be the name of the game, and the only safeguard we have is the Scripture. You have to know the Scripture. You have to know the Scripture. You have to fall in love with Jesus, and you have to learn the Scripture for yourself, because th that is their safeguard, is the Scripture. Verse 5, For many shall come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and shall deceive many, and shall, you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you not be troubled, for these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nations shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there should be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. Are we seeing this? There's famines in Africa. There's earthquakes in Australia. There's earthquakes in Southern California. There's earthquakes in Alaska. There's, it's happening everywhere. There's famines. People are starting to go without water. People are going without food. This is all happening. Pestilence. What about pestilence 19? What about, and by the way, it's pestilence says there's more to come, guys. I don't want to bring you down but you have to be prepared and you have to know the whole picture and the good news is, is we have Jesus we have Jesus so you don't want to go through this gloom and doom dark future of earth's history without Jesus verse 8 all these are the beginning of sorrow see Jesus told us ahead of time this is what you can expect guys then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. See, God's name. Jehovah. In, in, the, in the heart of the commandments is God's name. He is the creator. He created everything. He created the heaven, the earth, and the sea. And that's who we're supposed to worship, is the creator. He not only created everything, but Jesus redeemed us. He bought us back. We belong to Jesus two times over. And then shall many be offended, shall betray one another, and hate one another. And here's verse 11. And many false prophets shall arise and deceive many. And so just because somebody says they're a prophet, you don't believe it. You don't believe it just because somebody says they're a prophet, because most likely they're, they're a false prophet. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. And the gospel of this kingdom should be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then the end shall come. By the way, the true church of God, uh, God's people, uh, are almost 
uh, in every country in the world, almost, and basically uh, are, are breaking into the, the final few countries slash territories as we speak. Time is short. I'm here to tell you, get ready. Get ready. Get ready. This is, this is what we're looking at. So many false prophets should arise. So does that mean every, everybody that claims to be a prophet or everyone that raises up that, that may be a prophet that we're supposed to disregard? We have to test them, right? What does Joel 2 say? Joel 2, go to the minor prophets. What does Joel say what happened in the last days as far as prophets? This is partially fulfilled in Acts at the, at the day of Pentecost. But there's still more to come. Joel 2, looking at verse 28. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions. And so there will be true prophets. How do we know if someone's a true prophet or not? You have to go back to the scripture. You have to open up the scripture. You have to test the prophet by the scripture. The first test that I ever put any prophet to, that every single person I've ever tested to be a true prophet or not has failed, with the exception of one, is Isaiah 8.20. Isaiah 8.20. Who knows what Isaiah 8.20 says? What's that? To the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. So the prophet has to align with the law and the testimony. Has to align with the rest of the Bible. If not, they are a false prophet. The Bible is the test of a true prophet. By the way, who knows what verse 16 says in Isaiah 8? Because it gives us a very big hint of what the seal of God is. Anybody? Bind up the testimony. Seal the law among my disciples. What does God's people receive when they receive the seal of God? What gets sealed in their forehead? The law of God. A settling into the truth. The Holy Spirit filling them. The Ten Commandment law in their forehead. If you haven't memorized the Ten Commandments, I suggest you memorize it. One day we may not have the Bible. What are you going to do? What are you going to do when you don't have any Bible? People say it can't happen. Look at the French Revolution. They burn all the Bibles. These things are going to be repeated on a worldwide scale. What happened in Jerusalem back in 70 AD is going to happen on a worldwide scale. I'm telling you, get ready. It's coming. So, the mark of the beast, we can study that another day, but it obviously goes against the law of God. So, if you do what the wisest man uh, told us to do, which is fear God and keep His commandments, this is the whole duty of man, you're going to be okay. So you have to love Jesus, fear God, and keep His commandments. That is the seal of God. Now, turn with me quickly. I'm, I want to go to 2 Peter 3, verse 8. And I'm going to tell you some things, but please do not misinterpret what I'm going to say. We're not date setting, we're not doing any of that stuff, but I want you to realize time is short. And I want you to realize that the wise men knew when Jesus was born. There was a star that led them into the area where Jesus was. There's events that happen, and timing in the Bible is important. You know, If someone was a servant in the Old Testament, they would work six years, they would be released in the seventh year. In the Old Testament, you work the field, you'd work the field for six years, the seventh year you let it rest. The entire Bible, believers, work six days, and on the seventh day, what happens? They rest. The seventh day, they rest. Now, 2 Peter 3, 8, who has it? But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. And Psalm 90 verse 4 says something very similar that Peter's kind of quoting from. 
essentially. Psalm 90 verse 4 says, For a thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday when it is past, and as a watch in the night. Folks, I don't know how many of you guys have dates memorized of the Bible, biblical, important biblical dates and so forth and so on. But if you count back the generations, all the way to creation, and you go by this calendar we have today. By the way, be careful, because it's the Gregorian calendar. It's named after Pope Gregory. So be on, be on aware, be aware. Be aware of all these things. October. Oct is eight, but yet it's the tenth month in our calendar. September. September 7, but it's the ninth month in our calendar. December, dec. That means 10, but it's the twelfth month in our calendar. Why is that? Like, study things out, guys. Also, that's all I'm saying. Is like research. God gave you a brain. Use your brain. Study. Figure out these things, and, and, and God wants you to, to know what's going on. Revelation 12 says Satan deceives the whole world. That should scare people. We need to realize we need to be not part of this world. Love not the world, nor the things that are in the world. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes. They're not of the Father. They're of the world. We've got to pull out of that. We've got to come out of Babylon. Out of the confusion. So anyway, 4004 B.C. It could be off or whatever because, you know, when the Bible says that somebody's, uh, you know, 70 years old and, they, you know, they have an offspring or whatever. It's like, are they exactly 70 years old and so forth? Who knows, but I will tell you something interesting. 4,000 years later, in 4 B.C., something amazing happened. Who knows what happened in 4 B.C.? Jesus was born. You guys know that? Jesus was born. The Messiah, the Christ, the Anointed One, was born in 4 B.C., 4,000 years later. You fast forward to Jesus is about the age of 30. The 15th year of Tiberius Caesar, we told, in Luke chapter 3, verse 1, it's the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar. That year was 27 A.D. 27 A.D. Jesus is about 30 years old. 27 A.D. We're told by this gift of prophecy that we've been given that when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, that temptation and sin has been on this earth for 4,000 years. Over and over and over to the tune of 16 times, we're told. Jesus tempted in the wilderness, 4,000 years, 4,000 years, 4,000 years, 16 times. We're told by this gift that God's given us that the world, the history of the world will last 6,000 years. The great controversy on this world will last 6,000 years. We're told to the point of 25 times. Again, we're not nailing down dates, we're not looking at anything extremely specific, but I want you to know that this generation will not pass till all things be fulfilled. And by the way, if you add 2,000 years to when Jesus is being tempted in the wilderness to get your total grand total of 6,000 years, just, just for fun's sake, I'm not trying to get somebody excited on dates, but what date do you come to? 2027. That's not that far away, is it? That's actually very, very close, isn't it? But again, we can't be specific about dates. But the point is, is times are close. We're getting, we're getting close to the end. By the way, the Antichrist power that we undisputedly laid out clearly by the characteristics of Daniel 7 and Revelation 13 in a previous sermon identify that the Antichrist power is the Roman Catholic Church, the papacy, the Vatican, the, 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 the papal system, the Pope. We, we laid it out undisputedly. That, that, that's who it is. It's clear. All the 100% of the Protestant reformers figure this out. Do you know that in 2015 the papacy came out with an encyclical called Laudato Si? Laudato Si. And in Laudato Si, it explains that we have a, a, a worldwide crisis that every man, woman, and child has an issue with, and it's called climate change. And then the Pope puts, puts forward his solution to climate change. 
And in the cyclical, in this letter, the paragraphs are numbered. And when you get to number 237, guess what it calls for? What we know is the mark of the beast. And the world doesn't know that. But the, but the papacy says that we must rest on Sundays. We must give the world a rest as people because it needs it. And it compares the first day of the week to the Sabbath of the rest of the Bible. See, the day has been changed, you say. Not by God, but by the Antichrist. And it's very important. It's literally the difference between the mark of the beast and the seal of God. So in closing, I want to tell you, even right now, Haiti, and by the way, the mark of the beast officially starts in America and travels around the whole world. The whole world follows immediately according to Revelation 13. But right now in Haiti, in Belize, so forth and so on, they have no movement Sundays. You guys know this? No movement Sundays. You can't go anywhere. You're on lockdown. Why? Because it's the rumblings of the Roman power circling us. We have to know what's going on. It is coming. You have to wake up. Get ready. The time of trouble is upon us. We have to be ready to move into the country. We have to be ready to grow our own provisions because the problem of buying and selling will become a very serious one. You do not want to accept the mark of the beast for fear of lack of food and clothing for yourself or your family. I'm just telling you the truth. I'm just telling you the truth. And look, it's not gloom and doom because it's Jesus. We have Jesus. Jesus is right there with us the whole time. That's when we have to be friends with Jesus. That's when we have to know Jesus. That's when we have to pray. The whole world is dying. They're perishing around us. And it's our job to tell people. Amen. What are we doing? God is waiting for us. We literally can play a role in hastening the coming of Jesus. We need to be doing that. We need to be doing that. But let me tell you something. In closing here, just this past May, May of 2021, the Antichrist power says that they put in, they're implementing a seven-year plan. A seven-year plan to implement Laudato Sea worldwide. And guess what? The seventh year is a sabbatical. It means they don't do anything. They sit back and enjoy the fruits of their labor. And so in six years, they plan on having Lodato C in place. And guess what? When you forward six years, you just coincidentally come up with 2027. Again, I'm not setting a date. I'm just saying, wake up. God is in control. We can hasten the time. God can work with us. The mark of the beast can come into play tomorrow. It can come into play years down the road. But I'm telling you, time is short. We have to work on our characters now. It's very important. It's very important. If we have a dispute with a brother or sister, we have to do what Matthew 18 says. Take it to that brother or sister directly. Get it straightened out. Get, these, get this iniquity out of our hearts. Get on the same page. Don't shoot the messenger. Or the message. Accept the message and, 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 and say, I, I, need to, I need to accept this. And so time is short. Things are happening. You, ha you have all of these things. Things are tightening up in Poland. Things are tightening up around the world. And uh, I, just, I just think that we need to wake up and you need to look at the signs of the times and everything's happening.